All right, so you know about radioactivity and how atoms become more stable by giving off pieces of themselves or by releasing energy. Uh, the isotopes of elements that do that are called radioisotopes, and so that's what we're going to talk about. So radioisotopes are isotopes of elements that are radioactive. Not all isotopes are radioactive, but many are, and so we call those radioisotopes. We use radioisotopes. We have a practical usage for them. Um, we, we, instead of just saying, oh, isn't that neat, we can actually use them in science and medicine. Um, in science, uh, biology, chemistry, we can use them as tags. So we can create molecules that contain radioactive isotopes of atoms that should be normally in those molecules. And because they're radioactive and we can detect radioactivity, uh, we can follow molecules through their normal function and see what happens to them. Uh, they do that in biology all the time. As a matter of fact, when they were trying to figure out how viruses worked back in the 1950s, they made viruses that had radioactive sulfur uh, in the protein coating of the virus. And then they made more viruses different in a different place uh, where they, had, they used radioactive phosphorus. And that radioactive phosphorus was incorporated into the virus's DNA. And they were able to figure out you know, what part of the virus infects just by looking to see where the radioactivity was. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, in medicine, because radioactivity can kill cells, uh, we can, now you can normally, if you're exposed to radiation, why it's so dangerous is because it kills your cells. And it kills enough cells, it kills you. Uh, so we can use that ability in a more targeted or focused way to kill cells that we don't want around, like cancer cells. And so people often who are suffering from cancer will have radiotherapy, which is not sitting in front of a radio and dancing. Radiotherapy is targeting those cancerous cells with radiation to kill them. Very cool stuff, right? We can use these things to do some pretty powerful science. One of the radioisotopes that we're going to talk about that's a very important one is called carbon-14. And we use carbon-14 to determine the age of fossils. Uh, anything that used to be alive. And that's called radiocarbon dating. And it's a very interesting process. So carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of carbon. It contains six protons and eight neutrons. We already knew that, right? Because uh, it's carbon, so its atomic number is six, so six protons, and its mass number is 14, so it has to have a total of 14 particles. If six are protons, eight are neutrons, no big deal, right? This is an unstable form of carbon. Carbon doesn't like to have that many neutrons. Its nucleus is too big for such a small atom. Think about it. Carbon-14 is not a big atom compared to some of these other things. So it needs to get rid of some of that particle uh, bulk in its nucleus. And that's the radioactivity that it gives off. Uh, it does it in a very particular way. But uh, carbon-14, because it's carbon, um, and living things are made up of a great deal of carbon. Uh, all living things contain carbon-14. About one in one trillion carbon atoms is carbon-14. Now the rest are all usually carbon-12, tiny little bit of carbon-13, but carbon-14, one in a trillion atoms. That's not very much, but it's there in all living things. Plants, animals, everything alive has carbon-14 in it. And because they're alive, even though this carbon-14 is decaying at a regular rate, in other words, it's, it's decaying, it's turning into something more stable that's not carbon-14, um, all organisms have to eat. And what you eat is food that contains more carbon. Again, more carbon-14 comes into the system. So the amount of carbon-14 in anything alive is about the same at all times, about one in, one in a trillion, trillion atoms. Now, when something dies, that's not going to be the case anymore. Okay. So how did this carbon-14 get into your system in the first place? Where does it come from? Well, it turns out that it's made in the upper atmosphere. Uh, solar radiation, which is very, very powerful energy coming from the sun, when it hits the upper atmospheric gas particles, it knocks off neutrons. It knocks them right out of the, out of the nucleus, these high-energy neutrons. And these high-energy neutrons come down, shooting down towards the, towards the surface of the Earth. Well, once you get into the middle and lower atmosphere, most of that air is made up of nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen's normal, most stable isotope, the most abundant one, is nitrogen-14. And when one of these high-energy neutrons hits a nitrogen-14 atom, it sticks 
to the nucleus, but it also kicks out a proton. So it sticks to the carbon to the nitrogen 14 nucleus, it and it kicks out one of the protons. In other words, the nucleus of nitrogen, which has seven protons, has just lost a proton, it goes down to six, that's carbon, but it's also gained a neutron, so it's 14 particles, which for nitrogen is stable, uh, now becomes 14 particles for carbon, which isn't stable, and you have a radioactive carbon isotope. You'll notice this uh, little decay, or this uh, nuclear equation down here, and uh, the symbol for a neutron is just an N, with a zero on the bottom because there's no protons in a neutron, so zero, and a one on top because it's still one particle. And then on the other side of this, we have this carbon-14, and then we have this thing, one, one with a P. Well, P is proton, and proton is a proton, so it has a one, and its mass number is one. And those protons can go on to uh, take part in other chemical reactions in the upper atmosphere. But we're going to be interested in this carbon-14. So carbon-14 is made in the atmosphere. It is, uh, reacts with oxygen, just the way every, every other cat carbon atom does, and we get carbon dioxide that now contains this radioactive carbon, so it's radioactive carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide can be absorbed by plants. Carbon dioxide can be dissolved in water, and rainwater, and come down to the surface, and so eventually it gets down here to the surface. Plants are eaten by animals. Animals are eaten by humans. Sometimes plants are eaten by humans. Sometimes plants are made into objects like paper. Uh, but that's how the carbon-14 gets into the atmosphere, gets into the food cycle, and gets into you and me. Now, as long as we're alive, as long as these living things are alive, the amount of carbon-14 is constant. But the minute an organism dies, then they no longer take in more carbon. And then the amount of carbon-14 that was in them when they died starts to decay. And over time, it starts to decrease. And if we can figure out, when we have some remains, fossilized remains usually, if we can figure out how much carbon-14 is left in that fossil. And we know how long it takes for the carbon-14 to decay, then we can determine how old the fossil is. And that's what radiocarbon dating really is. Okay, uh, The way they actually figure out how much carbon-14 is left uh, the organism absorbs the carbon-14, about 1 in 1 trillion atoms. It dies, it becomes fossilized, but the carbon sticks around. The carbon is part of the fossil. Take a little piece of the fossil and you burn it. Anytime you burn anything with carbon in it, the carbon becomes carbon dioxide. Well, any carbon-14 that was in that fossil left over that hadn't decayed yet is now part of radioactive carbon dioxide. Carbon-14 will decay. When it decays, it turns back into nitrogen and it releases an electron. You can use a scintillation counter or a Geiger counter to pick up that, those electrons. And the number of those electrons that, that it picks up can tell you how much carbon-14 was in that fossil. So now we know how much carbon-14 was left in our fossil. We know how much there should have been, and we know how much there's left. Now we need to know how long does it take for carbon-14 to decay to turn back into nitrogen so that we can make a, a, a relationship between how much is left and how long it took to get there. And in order to do that, we need to know about something called half-life. Half-life is the rate at which um, radioactive isotopes decay. It's constant, and it's measurable. Now, in some cases, um, it's very short. In some cases, it's very long. But what half-life literally means is the amount of time necessary for half of a sample of radioactive atoms to decay and turn into something stable. Half. That's why it's called half-life. Sometimes they're seconds, sometimes they're years, sometimes they're thousands of years, sometimes they're millions of years. Half-lives depend on the radioactive isotope that you're talking about. Now, the thing about half-life is that it doesn't matter how many atoms you have, it'll always take the same amount of time for half of those atoms to decay. And that's kind of weird. You'd say, well, well, you mean if I have 100 atoms, it'll take a certain amount of time to get down to 50. But if I have a billion atoms, it'll take the same amount of time to get down to half a billion? That seems weird. Well, that's the way it works. The more atoms of a radioisotope you have, the faster they decay. So if they're going faster, it's going to take the same amount of time to get down to half of them. 
after each half-life is done, you have half as many atoms as you just had left. So that's a misconception about half-life. People think, oh, half-life, after two half-lives, you have nothing left. No, after two half-lives, you have 25% or one quarter of what you started with. After three half-lives, you have one eighth of what you started with, and so on and so forth. Okay, here's a little chart of the half-life uh, decay curve for carbon-14. So carbon-14's half-life is 5,730 years. That means if you have 100 atoms of carbon-14, after 5,730 years, you will have 50 atoms left. After another 5,730 years, you will have 25 atoms left. After another 5,730 years, you'll have about 12 and a half atoms. I know you can't have half an atom, so maybe it's 12 or 13, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if we plot this, the amount of or percentage of carbon remaining uh, and versus the time, you get a curve. And eventually you'll get down to zero, but it, it takes a very, very long time. The, the fewer atoms you have, the, the fewer decays you have, and then it takes the same amount of time to get down to half. Here's a similar kind of graph for some isotope. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. What matters is we're going to take a look and see, well, how does this change? Well, at t equals zero, that means we start with 100 grams of this radioisotope. And the, the half-life for this particular decay is 12.3 years. So that means it takes 12.3 years to decrease to half of what we started with. So after 12.3 years, we started with 100 grams, we're down to 50. After another 12.3 12, 12 years, so we've now, we've now been at this for 24.6 years. We're down to half again, so 25 grams. After another 12.3 years, at 36.9 years, we're down another half, 12.5 grams are left. After four half lives, another 12.3 years, we're at 49.2 years altogether, we're down to 6.25 grams. So what I want you to do right now is stop the video, figure out how long it will take us to get to the fifth and sixth half lives, and then how much of my original 100 grams is left after those two half lives, after the fifth and after the sixth half life. Go ahead, stop the video and try it out. Did you get it? So after the fifth half-life, it's going to take us 61.5 years to get there, and we should have 3.125 grams of our original sample left. After the sixth half-life, it's going to take us 73.8 years to get there, and we should have 1.5625 grams of our original sample left, and so on and so on, until eventually there's none left. Although with 12.3 years, it's going to take us a while to get down to zero. You can actually figure out how much. Okay?